presentation. I'm Dan Steinbach, the Dean of the College of Law, as many of you know. Uh, this is the latest lecture in our law school Stranahan National Issues Forum, which was initiated in the fall of 1990 through an endowment from the Stranahan Foundation as a joint program of the University of Toledo College of Law and the College's Federalist Society. And it's designed to address issues of national importance through the lens of the American legal system and uh, has been with us for, as I've said, almost 25 years. Over 40 of the nation's leading legal academics, economists, historians, political scientists, judges, journalists, and public policy professionals have participated in the Stranahan National Issues Forum. And today's speaker, Hans von Spakovsky, is a very worthy addition to the list, and we thank him for coming. The forum is one of uh, several events we have this semester, and I'd like to uh, highlight um, several of the ones coming up uh, for your attention. A week from today, October 6th, Judge Jed Rakoff of the Federal Court in New York City is speaking on why innocent people plead guilty. October 9th, a week from Thursday, Professor Mary Wood uh, from Lewis and Clark uh, Law School is speaking on Nature's Trust, Environmental Law for the New e Ecological Age. That same day, our alumnus, Professor Matt Mitten of Marquette, is speaking on sports law and his experience as an arbitrator at the Winter Olympics. Uh, the following day, October 10th, is our Law Review Symposium titled From Scalpel to Gavel exploring the modern state of health law. And finally, November 7th, we are having our Great Lakes Water Conference titled Defining and Defending Our Waters. Uh, the information about all of these is on our website. They're all free and open to the public. To introduce today's speaker, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Professor Lee Strang. As many of you know, Professor Strang teaches constitutional law property, administrative law, and constitutional interpretation. A prolific scholar, Professor Strang has published in the fields of constitutional law and, and interpretation and religion in the First Amendment, and he's currently editing a casebook on constitutional law. Professor Strang is faculty advisor to the Federalist Society, co-sponsor of today's event, and I thank him for organizing uh, and introducing today's talk, Professor Strang. Thank you, Dean Steinbach. And it is my pleasure to introduce this fall Stranahan lecturer, Mr. Hans A. von, Sp von Spakowski. Mr. von Spakowski is a graduate of MIT and Vanderbilt Law and embodies a rare combination of experience and learning in the field of election fraud. Mr. von Spakowski is a former federal election commissioner and is currently the manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative and the Senior Legal Fellow at the Heritage Foundation, which he joined in 2008. Prior to his tenure at the FEC, Mr. Von Spakovsky worked in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division, specializing in voting fraud. Mr. Von Spakovsky is a productive writer. In addition to his numerous articles, columns, and frequent blog posts, he also is the co-author of a number of books, including Who's Counting? Mr. Von Spakovsky also possesses years of in-the-trenches service on local election boards in both Virginia and Georgia. Mr. Von Spakovsky is a regular contributor to the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, National Review, among many others, and he appears regularly on national television and radio. In his Stranahan lecture today, Mr. Von Spakovsky will make the case that voter fraud exists and that it impacts elections, and then suggest remedies for the fraud that he identifies. He will speak for approximately 40 minutes, leaving 15 minutes for your questions and comments. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Von Spakovsky. Thanks, Lee. And before anybody asks, no, I, I did not hurt my foot getting into a fight with a debate opponent in a different, different speech. I would like to thank uh, both the law school and the Federalist Society for inviting me uh, here today. It's, it's a great honor to attend. But before I get into what I'm going to talk about, I did want to ask, how many students are there in the audience? Okay, well, I did want to mention to you, because I know you're always looking for internships and jobs, that the Heritage Foundation, where I work in Washington, 
has a great internship program for law students. Uh, the legal center where I work, we hire between four and five interns uh, every semester. And we have uh, three big advantages over other Washington, D.C. internships, especially those up on Capitol Hill. First, we actually pay you. Second, you do real work. You're not making photocopies. You're doing real research for the, the work we do. And third, we provide something that is uh, hard to come by, and that is we provide housing to our interns. So if you're interested, I, I'd urge you to go to the website and, and take a look at that. Um, I, I have to tell you, I, I was really honored by the invitation to speak here today. And frankly, it affirmed for, for me, again, what a, what a great country we live in. Um, I'm a first-generation American. My parents met in a displaced persons camp uh, in Europe after the end of World War II. And my mother had grown up in Nazi Germany. My father had fled communism. I mean, they were basically survivors of one of the bloodiest wars uh, ever fought in human history, uh, one that many other people did not survive. Uh, they immigrated to the US uh, 63 years ago. And uh, they were penniless when they got here, like a lot of immigrants. And I think it really says a lot about this country, You know, not so much about my family, but really a lot about this country that uh, their son, uh, gets an invitation to speak at this August Law School and to give you my views about election integrity. Um, when I was growing up, uh, I heard a lot of stories at the dinner table from my parents about what life was like living under a fascist dictator and under communism. And I have to tell you that that made me realize just how precious our democracy is uh, but also how fragile it is and how important it is for every citizen to work to preserve our republic, and that really it's ordinary city citizens who are the guardians uh, of that democracy. Now, under our Constitution, we choose our representatives at the local, county, state, and federal level. That is a fundamental building block of maintaining the kind of democracy that we have. Now, when we all vote this year, in less than a month, uh, will our votes be counted fairly, or will they be canceled or diluted by bureaucratic mistakes or errors, or by fraudulent votes cast by the dead, non-citizens, fictitious voters, or individuals voting more than once? Now, I'm the first to tell you we are a great republic, but we have an unfortunate and long history of voter fraud. Uh, in 1742, riots broke out in Philadelphia on Election Day, over claims that new German immigrants were being used to illegally increase vote totals. Yet today, as uh, John Fund and I documented in a book we published about two years ago, we've had numerous cases of non-citizens being found uh, registering and voting illegally in our most recent elections, including, by the way, in Ohio, and including, for example, in a 1996 congressional race in California a race decided by less than 1,000 votes, where a House committee who investigated the election found that uh, several hundred individuals who were not U.S. citizens had registered and voted in that election. Uh, in a fitting bit of irony, in 2011, about what, almost 20 years later, the head of an organization that many considered responsible for getting most of those uh, non-citizens illegally registered was convicted of voter fraud in California. Now, George Washington won his first race for the Virginia House of Burgesses by buying gallons of liquor for voters, something that James Madison refused to do, and James Madison lost his first race. By the way, uh, the recipe that he used to make whiskey at his own distillery was found a couple of years ago, and the Mount Vernon gave it to Jim Beam, and they're now producing that uh, whiskey if you want to buy some. Uh, just last week, in Texas, the campaign manager for four candidates for the school board in a town uh, called Donna, Texas, was indicted for buying votes with cocaine. In 2003, the U.S. Department of Justice convicted seven individuals in Knox County, Kentucky, for vote buying. And in 2004, they convicted eight precinct committee men in East St. Louis for the same thing, buying votes. Now, New York City was infamous for ballot stuffing throughout the 1800s. William Boss Tweed's ability to steal election in New York through the Tammany Hall machine was only rivaled by uh, 
uh, Mayor Daley in Chicago uh, in this century. But there were many other places where those kind of machines existed, including most infamously in Kansas City. Fraudulent votes were delivered by buying them through intimidation, by sending individuals from precinct to precinct to vote, and by using uh, illegal aliens, fictitious voters, and ineligible prison mates to vote. Now, Mayor Daley's vote-stealing machine was still in place six years after he died in the 1982 election in Illinois. Uh, there was a hotly contested governor's race at the time between the incumbent uh, Big Jim Thompson, a Republican, and he was being challenged by Democratic Senator Adelaide Stevenson III, who was the son of Adelaide Stevenson, the perennial presidential candidate. Thompson had a 15-point lead in the polls going into the race on Election Day, but Stevenson came within 5,000 votes of winning the state of Illinois. Now, not too long after the election, the FBI office in Chicago, the FBI field office, which probably is no surprise to you is one of the largest FBI field offices in the country, got a call from a uh, man who was very angry. He had been promised a city job after the election if he helped work in one of the precincts and helped stuff ballots on election day. He did that, but then the promise was broken and he was told he wasn't going to get a city job. So he called the FBI, spilled the beans of what happened, and that started the largest voter fraud investigation ever conducted by the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, eventually, the entire FBI field office was involved, and a federal grand jury was convened. Now, the federal grand jury did something, uh, for those of you who, who know about criminal law, did something very unusual. They published their grand jury report after they were finished. The estimate by the U.S. attorney was that 100,000 fraudulent votes had been cast in Chicago in the 82 election. The FBI agent in charge of this investigation, who I actually interviewed, uh, said that there was voter fraud in every single precinct in Chicago and that the Justice Department ran out of resources to investigate and prosecute the case. They indicted 65 individuals. They were all convicted except for one guy who died and one who um, was found incompetent to stand trial. Now, the reason I talk about this case is that it illustrated all the different kinds of ways and all the different methods that people have used to steal elections. In Chicago in 82, there was coercion of the disabled and elderly or the outright theft of their ballots. There was impersonation of registered but absent voters at the polls. There were votes by people who were not U.S. citizens. There was a use of false addresses for registration, fraudulent absentee ballots, Vote buying, particularly of the homeless, the going rate at the time was $2 a vote. Votes by 3,000 voters who were dead. Double votes by 31,000 people who were registered in more than one location in the city. Uh, thousands of votes cast by prisoners in the state prison system and the actual altering of vote counts in the precincts. The U.S. Attorney, by the way, estimated uh, along with the grand jury, that there were 80,000 illegal aliens registered to vote in Chicago, and a, and a couple of dozen of them were actually convicted for doing that. Now, the Tammany Hall daily machine tradition continued elsewhere. In 1984, in Brooklyn, New York, we have another state grand jury report this time. And again, uh, the local DA, who was a former Democratic Congresswoman, Elizabeth Holtzman, thought it was so important what her grand jury found that she published the report of the state grand jury, which you can read. Uh, what it reported on was a 14-year successful voter fraud conspiracy in Brooklyn that had cast literally thousands of bogus votes in Democratic primaries for both state legislative and congressional races. The New York Times, which these days, if you read the editorial page, says there's no voter fraud in the country, actually published a story when this uh, grand jury report was published. It was titled, Boss Tweet is Gone, But Not His Vote. Now, how did they do it? Well, they cast thousands of, of fraudulent votes by impersonating deceased voters, newly registered voters, and fictitious voters whose names had been successfully registered using what New York uniquely had at the time, which is mail-in voter registration. Uh, 
they had 20 crews of six to eight people each who were given a long list of names of people to vote for, who, who, whose names they should vote in, and these crews went from polling place to polling place to polling place, casting ballots. Now, one of the things the grand jury report recommended was that the state legislature study voter ID, because this would not have been able to happen if a voter ID law had been in place, which New York doesn't do. It doesn't have. New York ignored that. Now, all of this may sound like old news. Uh, of course, these reports came out, I think one when I was in college, one when I was in law school, so they don't seem that far away to me. Uh, but last year in New York City, and you can Google this and find it, it makes a very interesting reading, the New York Department of Investigations released a report. They were concerned about the fact that the New York Elections Board is not cleaning up their voter registration list by taking people off who've died and moved away or in prison. So they decided on election day last year to send in their undercover investigators into different polling places to ask for the ballots of individuals who were not supposed to be on the registration vote. In 97% of the cases, the investigators were handed the ballots. And they were often handed the ballots, for example, one of their investigators is a 24-year-old who was handed the ballot of an 87-year-old woman who had died a year before. Now, one of the only cases where the investigator did not, was not given a ballot was one of the investigators went in, he was going to try to vote in the name of a felon whose name was not supposed to be on the registration list, and it turned out that the felon's mother was a precinct official in where he was trying to vote. Want some news about fraud that has affected every single person in this room? In 2008, you know, we had one of the closest U.S. Senate races in history in Minnesota. After a long eight-month court fight, Al Franken was, was declared the winner by the court over the incumbent, uh, Norm Coleman. Uh, the vote was decided by about 300 votes. Uh, we now know through a, a comparison that was done of the voter registration list and state correction records that almost 1,400 felons voted illegally in that election. So the number of ineligible voters was, what, four times the margin of victory in that case. How did that affect all of you? Al Franken was the 60th vote needed by Democrats in the Senate to pass Obamacare. Now, the Milwaukee Police Department investigated the 2004 election. They found all kinds of problems with voter registration voting, including campaign staffers from out of state who came into the state working for the John Kerry campaign, who took advantage of the same-day registration laws in Wisconsin and registered and voted illegally in the state. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should, because in 2008, prosecutors in Ohio investigated about a dozen uh, individuals from other states, including staffers for the Barack Obama campaign and an organization called um, vote from home who registered illegally in Ohio, all of them listing as their residents this small house in Columbus. Now this wasn't discovered by election officials, this was discovered by some student, enterprising student reporters. And as a result, a number of people were convicted um, for illegally registering and voting. By the way, one of them was a woman who was then fired by a New York congressman for whom she worked. She was registered and voted in New York, but she had registered and voted in uh, Wisconsin also. Anyway, she worked for a New York congressman who fired her after this news came out. Uh, you may be aware of the unrepentant Meloise Richardson, who was convicted in Ohio of mul voting multiple times in the 2012 and other elections. Uh, she was sentenced to five years here in prison. She was let out early. And at a voting rally in Ohio this year, she was brought on stage after she'd been released from federal prison and was uh, congratulated by Al Sharpton as a hero for what she had done. Now, I could list numerous other examples for you of voter fraud. I won't do that. Uh, I, as I said, I wrote a book two years ago called Who's Counting, in which we go through and list case after case after case of voter fraud prosecutions by state and federal officials, some of which affected the outcome of election, elections. So I'm not going to go through all that. But I want to tell you part of the problem here is that, unfortunately, 
Many civil rights organizations tolerate voter fraud and claim that prosecutions are racist and it's intended to suppress minority voters, even though minority voters are often the targets of this kind of voter fraud. Now, I'll give you an example of this. The FBI got a call in the mid-1990s from a Democratic African-American candidate in Alabama. He was a reformer. He had tried running for a county commission office in his home county, and he believed that the election had been stolen from him. The FBI went in, started to investigate, and they ended up indicting and convicting 11 local officials for massive absentee ballot fraud and stealing elections. Now, this was a one-party town. This was Greene County, Alabama. Greene County is probably one of the poorest rural counties in the, in the state of Alabama. It's 80% black. All the defendants in the case were black. They were black Democrats who were uh, held local offices. Uh, the people whose elections they had stolen, as I said, were African-American Democratic challengers. They were reformers who wanted to clean up the county government. These reformers, whose elections have been stolen, called the NAACP, they called the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, thinking that those organizations would help them out. Instead, those organizations went after the U.S. Justice Department, claiming that they were trying to intimidate black voters by investigating this, and actually comparing, in a press release, the prosecutors to the Gestapo. Instead of helping the victims of this, they helped the defendants, even bringing in a, a law professor from Stanford, Pamela, Pamela Carlin, to help defend the vote stealers. She, by the way, has now been appointed by the Obama administration as a deputy in the Civil Rights Division, where she's responsible for enforcing voting rights. One of the people who pled guilty was the national treasurer of the SCLC, and he remained its treasurer even after he was convicted of basically stealing ballots from black residents of that county. Following the convictions, turnout in an overwhelmingly black county went up dramatically in Greene County. And that brings up an important point. And I got this when I did this case. I actually went to Greene County, I interviewed people there for uh, the book rewrote, and what voters said to me was they turned out and they voted after these convictions because they now felt like their vote was going to count. And that's an important issue that everybody needs to understand. It's something that the Supreme Court recognized when it upheld Indiana's photo ID law that maintaining the confidence of the public in the election process is very important. Now, criminal prosecutions are laudable, but they are a low priority with prosecutors, in part because they have other crimes they consider more pressing. You know, when you've got burglaries and rapes, murders, assaults, election crimes tend to take a low priority. They also can be uh, something that prosecutors fear to pursue because of these absurd charges of intimidation and racism that come out uh, against the prosecutors. But does this still happen across the country? Yeah, it does. Uh, about two years ago, in Troy, New York, there was a large voter fraud prosecution. One of the campaign consultants who was convicted of helping to steal ballots said, well, everybody does this. It's a tradition here. And he was actually surprised that the police were investigating it and prosecuting it. And who did they target in that prosecution? That is, the people who were uh, convicted of voter fraud. They were, they were targeting poor minority communities. Why? Because the consultant said those are the people least likely to notice that somebody had stolen their vote and least likely to complain about it. Now, there is a problem with voter registration lists all over the country. The Pew Foundation, which is you know, not exactly a con conservative organization, released a report last year in which they said that 24 million voter registrations across the country are filled with significant errors. They found almost 2 million people who are dead who are still registered to vote, and they found almost 3 million people who are registered in more than one state. I mean, some places have more people registered than the census says they have eligible people entitled to vote, including, by the way, Ohio. 
which has a number of counties like that. And Ohio this year settled a lawsuit that was filed against it over the fact that it wasn't cleaning up its voter registration list like it should by taking people off who uh, have died or moved away. Is that a potential problem? Well, I live in Virginia, Fairfax County. The county just discovered 17 people in our county, just one county in the state, who have been regularly in elections for uh, uh, quite a while going back, have been voting in both Maryland and Virginia, which of course is illegal. That's a felony under federal law to do that. It's a felony under most state laws. And could it make a difference? Well, in a close election, it could. Now, how do we solve this particular problem? There are a number of steps you can do that. None of them are ever going to prevent all the different kinds of fraud that are possible. But in combination, they can be a powerful deterrent and a powerful weapon against voter fraud, and none of them will keep eligible people from voting. Now, the most obvious of those is requiring an ID when you vote, both at the polling place and in the absentee voting process. Requiring proof of citizenship when you register to vote is another. In both of these cases, the courts have almost uniformly held that that is both constitutional and not discriminatory and not a substantial burden on the right to vote. Court clerks in every county, in every state, should be required to notify election officials when people they've called for jury duty. You know, you're called for jury duty from what? Voter registration lists. Well, when people are called for jury duty and they then swear under oath that they are not a United States citizen and are excused from jury duty, court clerks do not routinely send that information to election officials, which obviously they ought to do. Uh, good election administration practices also help. States should be running um, database comparisons between voter registration lists and other state lists, like the DMV, with federal databases, like the Social Security Index, to uh, find people who are dead, and with other records, like those maintained by DHS, Department of Homeland Security, so they can find people who aren't US citizens and take them off the rolls. Now let's talk about the most controversial of these recommendations, which is voter ID. Uh, governor Lincoln Chafee, governor of Rhode Island, an independent, when he signed their new voter ID law, which was sponsored by Democrats in the state legislature, he said this, requiring ID at the polling place is a reasonable request to ensure the accuracy and integrity of our elections. Now I'm sure you're surprised by the fact that I said this bill was sponsored by Democrats in the state legislature. Because you've been hearing this story and this myth that um, I, voter ID is a Republican plot to suppress the vote. Well, the Rhode Island bill was sponsored by an African-American Democratic state senator who said he sponsored it because he had actually seen voter fraud occurring in the polls. And he said, quote, very few adults lack one of the forms of ID that will be accepted, and the rare person who does can get a free voter ID card, and that he would not support any obstacle to voting. When Kansas passed its voter ID laws, which frankly is one of the best in the country, two-thirds of the Democrats in the State House voted for it, and three-quarters of the Democrats in the State Senate voted for it. Now, a couple of years ago, Arthur Davis, he's a former Alabama Democratic congressman, former um, member of the Congressional Black Caucus, he posted an article in a Montgomery newspaper that caused quite a ruckus. Now, I don't want to give you a long quote, but I want to read something from it, because I think this essentially captures a part of what's been going on here. This is what Davis said. I've changed my mind on voter ID laws. I think Alabama did the right thing in passing one, and I wish I'd gotten it right when I was in political office. When I was a congressman, I took the path of least resistance on this subject for an African-American politician. Without any evidence to back it up, I lapsed into the rhetoric of various partisans and activists. The truth is, is that the most aggressive contemporary voter suppression in the African-American community, at least in Alabama, is the wholesale manufacture of ballots at the polls and absentee in parts of the Black Belt. The Black Belt of Alabama, by the way, includes Greene County that I was telling you about before. If you doubt it exists, I don't. I've heard the peddlers of these ballots brag about it. I've been asked to provide the funds for it, 
and I'm confident it has changed at least a few close local elections. That is the key to the voter fraud issue, is close elections. Now, let me tell you what the U.S. Supreme Court, in fact, said about that. Most people are surprised to learn that the U.S. Supreme Court upheld photo ID for voting as purely constitutional in 2008. They did it when they looked at Indiana's photo ID law, which was looked at, the court said, was the strictest photo ID law in the country. And what the court said about it was this, examples of such fraud have been documented throughout this nation's history by respected historians and journalists, and not only is the risk of voter fraud real, but it could affect the outcome of a close election. Now, for those of you who are saying, oh, I'm sure it was those evil conservatives on the court that wrote that opinion upholding Indiana's photo ID law, nope. The majority opinion was written by Justice John Paul Stevens, one of the liberal stalwarts of the court for decades before he retired. The ACLU's arguments in that case before the court that there's no voter fraud in the country, we don't need to worry about it, uh, didn't go very far with Justice Stevens, who, if you know anything about his biography, you know that before he became a justice, he was a practicing attorney where? In Chicago, Illinois. Um, Last year, Ohio Secretary of State John Husted noted that in the 2013 general elections here, there were 110 recounts. You had 35 local races and eight local issues that were decided by only one vote or by breaking a tie. And as he said, just one person could make the difference in deciding whether local taxes would go up and whether someone else would have served in important local offices. Uh, the overwhelming evidence, by the way, shows that contrary to the claims of opponents, voter ID does not depress the turnout of voters. A study by the University of Delaware, Nebraska, which looked at several elections in all 50 states to see what effect voter ID might have on turnout, concluded with this quote, concerns about voter ID laws affecting turnout are much ado about nothing. Now, we know that for sure. Why? Because we now have more than six years of actual turnout results in states with photo ID laws. Let me talk about that for just a moment, because this is very important. It's important to get the facts here, not the narrative myth you've been getting in the mainstream press. Georgia and Indiana are considered to have two of the strictest photo ID laws in the country. The Georgia law went into effect in 2008. The Indiana law went into effect in 2008. So it's been effective in every federal election since then. Voting in both Georgia and Indiana increased more dramatically in 2008 in the first presidential election held after the ID laws went in place than many states without photo ID. In Georgia in 08, compared to 04, they had the largest turnout in the state's history. Democratic turnout in the state went up over six percentage points. That was the second biggest increase in Democratic turnout in the entire country. The overall turnout in Georgia was almost, increase in turnout was almost seven percentage points. That was the second largest increase in turnout in nation. I'm sorry, the Democratic turnout was the fifth largest. The overall turnout was the second largest increase in the nation. Georgia is one of the states that was covered under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, so they actually keep records on the race of everyone who's registered. So according to the certified election returns of the Secretary of State in the 08 election, the turnout of black voters went up 42 percent, the turnout of Hispanic voters went up 140 percent, white turnout was only up 8 percent. And remember, opponents are saying black and Hispanic turnout would have gone down because of this new voter ID law coming in place. Now, I realize Barack Obama was on the ballot. There was increased black turnout across the country. In fact, we had the highest turnout in a presidential election since the early 1960s. But remember what I just said. The increase in turnout in Georgia was larger than almost every other state in the country, including many states that don't have ID like New York and Illinois. In 2010, in Georgia, Barack Obama was not on the ballot. And you all remember 2010 was actually a surge elections for the Republicans, right? That's, that's where they took over the U.S. House of Representatives. Well, in 2010, 
black turnout in comparison to 2006, the last congressional midterm election when there was no voter ID in place, black turnout went up 44 percent, Hispanic turnout went up 66 percent, white turnout was up only 11 percent. In 2012, so two years ago, when Barack Obama was reelected, the U.S. Census Bureau put out a report. It was a report on turnout across the country broken down by race. In Georgia, with one of the strictest voter ID laws in the country, blacks voted at a higher rate than whites. Now, the Georgia voter ID requirement was upheld in federal court. It was upheld in state's court. They said the law was not discriminatory. It didn't violate the Constitution. And the Georgia Federal District Court noted that after years of litigation, none of the plaintiffs could produce a single person, a single witness, who would be unable to vote because of the voter ID requirement, including, by the way, the NAACP, who was a plaintiff in the case, who couldn't find a single one of their members who didn't already have an ID. Uh, in Indiana, you had exactly the same thing happen. Indiana's photo ID law goes in place in 08. The turnout of Democratic voters increased by over eight percentage points. That was the largest increase in Democratic turnout of any state in the United States. In 2010, you again had a large surge in black turnout. And what does the U.S. Census Bureau say about 2012, about Indiana with the strictest photo ID law in the country? It says that blacks outvoted whites by 10 percentage points. Interesting quote from the federal district court on the Indiana case, and I'm going to read this to you because I think it makes an important point again. Despite apocalyptic assertions of wholesale voter disenfranchisement, plaintiffs have produced not a single piece of evidence of any identifiable registered voter who would be prevented from voting pursuant to the voter ID law because of his or her inability to obtain the necessary photo ID. That is why just two weeks ago, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals upheld Wisconsin's photo ID law, threw out an injunction that had been issued against it by a federal district judge, and chastised the federal judge because the federal judge had said he did not have to follow the U.S. Supreme Court on this issue. It was not precedent. Uh, how many times have you heard people say that when someone is exercising a constitutional or a fundamental civil right, they should not have to show an ID? This is an argument that I hear all the time. Well, the ability to travel freely in the U.S. is a fundamental right. While most people remember the civil rights movement was about voting, it started as a movement for access to public transportation. Yet the fact that you have to show an ID if you want to get on an airplane uh, does not cause anyone to say that that's the reimposition of Jim Crow and that that's a problem. Uh, the right to work is a fundamental right. But you don't hear anyone complaining about the fact that under federal law, an employer cannot hire you unless you prove your identity and authenticate that you are either a U.S. citizen or you have a work permit to write. Uh, under the First Amendment, you have a right, you know the rights to free speech, you know the right to freedom of worship. You may forget about, there's another right in there, we, we don't pay a lot of attention to, the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. That's basically your ability to go complain to a government official about what they're doing, right? Well, if you want to go to the U.S. Department of Justice, like a lot of federal buildings, and you want to get an appointment with Eric Holder, to complain about his opposition to photo ID requirements, uh, don't show up there without a government-issued photo ID because you won't get into the building without one. Uh, another very fundamental right, as all of you know, is the right to, to marriage. We know that because the U.S. Supreme Court said that it's a fundamental right in a very famous case called Virginia v. Loving, when they threw out the ban on interracial marriages. Well, I checked the web page for Lucas County in Toledo before I got here, and if you want to exercise your fundamental right to get married in this county, uh, you can't get married without, quote, 
a valid government-issued picture ID, only driver's license, state ID card, passport, or military ID will be accepted. And finally, if you want to exercise your Second Amendment right to purchase a firearm, try doing that without a government-issued ID. Uh, polls show overwhelmingly that the American people support voter ID as a common sense reform. And that majority support goes across all racial, ethnic, and even party lines. A majority of African Americans, a majority of whites, a majority of Hispanics all support uh, voter ID. I think that's because they know that you can just about not function in everyday life without a photo ID. You know, you need one to get a library card, drink a beer, cash a check, board an airplane, check into a hotel, or if you're poor, in a lot of states, you're going to need it if you want to apply for welfare benefits or food stamps. That's one of the reasons, by the way, that Andrew Young, you may remember Andrew Young, our UN ambassador, appointee of Jimmy Carter, um, he actually supports voter ID. He, he actually says it's a quote-unquote freedom card. And he said that what we ought to be doing is for the very small percentage of people who don't have an ID, we should be throwing all our resources into getting them one because that's a ticket to their participation in mainstream America. And by the way, on that one issue, how many people don't have an ID, you'll see all these ridiculous numbers thrown around by the Brennan Center saying that 10 percent, 25 percent of people don't have ID. Well, again, we have actual numbers on that rather there than their predictions. In Georgia, just like every other state, every state that's passed a photo ID law has put in a provision that you can get a free one if you don't already have one. The predictions in Georgia were that 600,000 people didn't have ID, wouldn't be able to vote if this ID law went into place. Well, the state provides a free ID to anyone who doesn't have one, and rather than it being 10% of the registered voters, there are six million. Rather than it being 5% of the registered voters, the number of people every year who go to get a free ID doesn't even average one-tenth of 1%. It averages about five one-hundredths of 1%. And again, that's because you almost can't do anything in this country without an ID. We are one of the world's only democracies uh, that does not uniformly require a photo ID to vote. It's an easily met requirement and a basic necessity for protecting the integrity of the election process. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story about this. Uh, in 2012, um, the European EU sent observers to, to observe our election. Did you all hear about this? They sent about 100 people uh, who are part of the EU to observe our elections. Uh, I was asked to brief them before they spread out across the country. and. Um, the briefing that I was supposed to do was on this issue, voter ID. And there was a, uh, my debate partner was someone from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, actually someone I've known for many years. Uh, we debate each other a lot. And he got to go first. And he went on this long discussion complaining about voter ID and making all the arguments that I think I've hopefully disabused you of. And then he turned to me. And I, I can tell you, the audience really kind of looked confused from my standpoint. So when it got to me, I said, um, and remember, there were many different countries represented here. I said, how many of you live in a country where you don't have to show a photo ID to vote? Only three people out of a room of 100 raised their hand. Because we are only one of the only democracies that doesn't do that. Even Mexico, our southern neighbor, which has a much larger population in poverty than we do, requires a photo ID. This was put in in the early 1990s, and not only do they require a photo ID, the photo ID has to have your thumbprint on it. And not only did turnout not go down in Mexico after this ID requirement went in, turnout went up, and in fact, a lot of people credited, you all may recall, that for the first time in like 60 years, the opposition party finally elected a president in Mexico. And a lot of people credit the fact they put in a photo ID requirement for that. Um, Rhode Island Democratic State Representative uh, John Bryan said, when their voter ID law was passed, that voting is one of the most important rights and duties that we have as Americans, and it should be treated accordingly. 
I agree with that, as do the majority of Americans. We need to replace our honor system that we have today with a system that verifies the authenticity of voter registrations and the identities of people casting ballots, not just at the polling place, but through the absentee ballot process. Ensuring that only eligible citizens register and vote is not an attempt to suppress anyone from voting. It's a basic principle of ensuring integrity in the election process. Uh, the right to vote in a free and fair ele election is a basic civil right, but it's a right on which all of our other fundamental civil rights and liberties depend. And it's something that we've got to guarantee if we want to continue to successfully have the greatest experiment in self-government governance that uh, the world has ever seen. Particularly if an election is close, and that happens all the time, all around the country, particularly in local elections, the possibility exists that the winner will be decided not by the American people, but by fraudulent ballots cast by people who are exploiting the weaknesses in the system. Only by maintaining the integrity of the process can we also maintain the public's confidence in the system and the continuation of American uh, democracy. Uh, those are the steps that I think we should take, we must take, and that we can take to preserve the system of freedom, liberty, and limited government that we have, and that was established by our Constitution, which William Gladstone, the former Prime Minister of England, once called the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. Thank you. So, so we, we have time for questions, right? I, I'll be happy to answer questions. Yes, ma'am. Greetings. Uh, my question is about your opinion on how we shift the discussion, because much of what you talked about centered on race and African Americans in particular, but much of it is equal parts of partisanship. If you were to look at what go by the census track voter registration and the population characteristics, it doesn't address that. So if you take into consideration the supremacy clause, and also the drama in America that is going to occur, you probably will always see a spike in African American turnout going forward. So what's your suggestion about how to frame the discussion so that we resolve it globally as citizens of the United States versus always, you know, zeroing in on African Americans? Um. Well, actually, uh, I'm, I, I just finished a draft of an article with my co-author where we talk a lot about something that um, actually Jimmy Carter, Andrew Young, and Bill Clinton are doing. Um, you know, they've come up with a proposal to uh, change our Social Security cards into a photo ID, which would basically, uh, they say, solve this whole problem of the partisanship in this, you know, Democrats, Republicans fighting about this, um, and what they say is that, you look, the Social Security Administration already issues everybody a Social Security card. They don't think it would take that much to uh, revamp it so that it could be a, a photo ID. And they, again, make the point, the one I made earlier, the one that An uh, Andrew Young makes a lot, which is that for the very small number of people who don't have an ID, this would provide them with an entry into mainstream culture, which they need if they want to get get prosper economically and, and otherwise. And I, I think that's a, there are particular, there are some problems with that, but I think that's actually a solution that people should potentially look at. And this is not something that came from the right side of the political aisle. This is something that's coming from the liberal side of the political aisle by some very, very respected people, including two former presidents. And I, I think that's something we ought to look at. Yes, sir. Have you also looked closely at any fraud or irregularities after legitimate votes are cast, I mean, in the counting process? Well, that does happen occasionally. It's a lot tougher these days, I think, to do that than the way they used to do it, for example, in Chicago. Okay? And one of the reasons they were able to do that in, Ch in Chicago, that happened all the time. And the reason it happened all the time is because uh, they would do the vote counts in the precincts and then forward that information to the to the city officials, and they would just go by that. And these days, you know, most of the counting is done, a lot of the counting is done in central locations where there are lots of poll watchers to observe it. And I have to tell you, you, want, you all want to do something in the elections? Then be a poll watcher in the next election. I don't care which party you're a member of. 
the best way of, of guaranteeing our elections is by both parties and third parties having poll watchers in every step of the election process. You know, watching what's happening in precincts where people are voting, watching what's happening downtown where they're counting the ballot, because what that means is that you have transparency, and that's a key to having good, good elections. Yeah. Um, do you know of another country where the political parties create, maintain, and monitor the election process? Uh, well, I think what you're referring to is, I, I, I'll tell you something that was kind of funny. When I was on the FEC, Federal Election Commission, you know, most people hear FEC, Federal Election Commission, and they think, well, we must run elections in the country, which, of course, is not true at all. Uh, the U.S. has the most decentralized election um, system in the world. There is no federal agency in Washington that runs federal elections. The only thing the FEC does is it's responsible for campaign finance, you know, regulating the financing of congressional presidential campaigns. In almost every other European democracy, for example, they have a central government agency that runs federal elections. We don't have that here. Here, our elections, including federal elections, are run at the state level, and not even really the state level, they're run at the local level, down the counties and town townships. And in a lot of states, it's the, po the political parties that actually are responsible for running primaries, which I think is what you're, what you're talking about. And that's not really... No, no, I was talking about districting, um, <coughs> uh, counting. Uh, the people who count are routinely political officials. Oh, well, you're... you're I, okay, so you, you, you're talking about the fact that uh, people who work as poll officials are members of the different political parties? Is that, is that what you mean? States attorneys general. More typically. I don't think that's that different from in European countries where both election officials and whoever the, their equivalent is of the chief attorney general. I mean, they're appointed by the, you know, they have parliamentary systems. And whichever party wins the majority in parliament, and therefore gets to, to choose a prime minister, they're the ones that are appointing all those government officials. Yeah. I think he's referring to the fact that election boards are appointed by parties. Right. And therefore, I have equal numbers so that you have the parties running the elections rather than the government. Yeah, that, we, we were actually, we had a nice dinner last night. We were talking about that. I, I've done this down at the county level. I was on a county election board in Georgia and also one in Virginia. I've also been at the FEC, which was you know kind of very similar. And I will tell you that while I think the best system to have is to have a citizen board in each county that runs elections, and I think it's a good thing to have the parties represented, because what happens then is you have the parties watching each other like hawks to make sure that everything is done correctly. Yeah, occasionally it doesn't work out, because occasionally you get people who aren't very good, but I frankly don't like the idea of giving total control over to one individual rather than a board or a commission, and particularly by those who claim, oh, we'll just we'll put somebody nonpartisan in charge of that. I used to work in the federal government as a career person, and I, I never met a single person who wasn't partisan one way or another in the career ranks of, of the government. So, yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I have been a rover for several elections, um, involved with the Board of Elections here, and I think to just focus on ID, it's clouding a much bigger issue. It's not so much about the ID, it's about people receiving provisional ballots when they shouldn't, when they show up, about machines not being calibrated properly. So they hit one thing and another one shows up. That has nothing to do with ID. That has a lot more to do with holding the Board of Elections accountable, people's votes being treated with respect and being made sure that they are allocated properly. I think that's a much larger issue than just the ID. Oh, oh, look, I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, as I told you, like the book that I wrote two years ago, the final chapter, the whole chapter is a whole series of recommendations. And one of the problems that you're talking about is uh, the calibration problem with electronic voting machines. And if everybody doesn't know what that means, you ever use an ATM where you're supposed to touch the screen and where you touch it, it doesn't read it? 
that's because it hasn't been properly calibrated. And you have to be really careful with the electronic voting machines, those are the kinds, you know, the touch screen machines. If they're not calibrated exactly right, then where you put your finger, the machine isn't going to read that uh, properly. And look, you, you have to blame, you can blame Congress for the fact that a lot of people don't like electronic voting machines like that. But the reason they're in every single precinct in every single county, in every state in the country, is because in 2002, Congress, as part of its reform effort after the 2000 presidential election, passed a federal law called the Help America Vote Act that required that there be an electronic voting machine in at least one in every precinct everywhere in the country. So if you have a complaint about electronic voting machines like that, you know, you don't trust them, you're going to have to go to Congress and get them to change that, that law. Yeah, what, time for one, one more. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it seems like um, you're really focused on getting um, photo IDs for voter registration. And for older populations that may no longer be using state-issue IDs for driving or um, for other reasons, may not have access to them. Um, so how would you recommend we allow them to vote under the kind of regulations that you that, that is an issue that has been constantly raised in every single lawsuit that's been filed against voter ID. Okay? First of all, every state, every state will issue a uh, photo ID card, even if it's not a driver's license, as, as I'm sure you know. Okay? And in every single case, I, I, I'll talk about one great example of this, um, and this was the Georgia lawsuit where I went through, and I actually didn't just read the court decisions, I read the uh, depositions that were taken of the witnesses that the ACLU and others were putting up. And they brought in a lot of elderly individuals claiming they would not be able to vote. But even if you are retired, uh, I'll tell you, people need ID for the most basic things, just going to the doctor, uh, going to many pharmacies to get something filled. Uh, you would be surprised how, how much elderly people have IDs. And in fact, if you want to see something that's scary, the National Transportation um, Department puts out statistics on driver's licenses held in every state, and they break it down by age. And if you go look at that and you, you see how many people in their 90s and 80s still have their driver's licenses, you know, that's just scary. My point is, though, that that, that really has... It's been found that that is not, that is not a problem. Uh, the elderly have not had a problem voting in the states that have put in voter ID. And in fact, um, a year or so ago, I did something that I thought was kind of interesting. I went back to the Georgia lawsuit, which was filed back in 2006, and I pulled out the names of every individual plaintiff and every witness that the ACLU had put up as say, these people would not be able to vote if this voter ID law goes in place because they don't have an ID or they won't be able to get one. And most of them were people who were retired, who were elderly. And I took that list and I went to the Georgia Secretary of State's office and I pulled the voting records on all these people who had sworn under oath they would never be able to vote because of this new voter ID law. They've all been voting for years in election after election. So that is just not, it is, a, a, the experience of states with photo IDs, laws in place, that has not been a problem because people who are elderly need ID just as much, if not more, than, than other folks. Thank you very much. Thanks.